Hey folks, I'm Keith Ford and I'm here with Larry Vickers at the Brownells booth at SHOT Show 2019. Welcome to- Hey, thank you, bro. Welcome to our Facebook Live. Yes, sir. Larry has got a lot of stuff going on. I mean, the Vickers books, Aztec training, uh, Vickers tactical. Man, you have got it all kind of stuff yeah. going on. I think it's the third year we've done this. Yes, sir. And um, the train hadn't slowed down yet. That's good. The latest book, Vickers guidebook is AK Volume mm -hmm. 1. We released it just before Christmas in 2018. You got it. Yes, absolutely. AK guide. Perfect. And uh, we actually have it here at the show for mm -hmm. sale uh, at the Arsenal booth. Okay. Today, day two of the show, Ian from Forgotten yep. Weapons is there as well at 2, 2 p.m. to 3.30, and we're co-signing the books, and then tomorrow I'm just by myself. Mm -hmm. But, um, yeah, it, the books have done great. Yeah, now Fantastic. Th this year the AK book, that's a lot of stuff in there. I mean. A lot of guys say, okay, yes, yeah, AK. Well, AKs, every country had their own basic variation on that. Yeah, and you know, between the, the Vickers Guide crew, mm -hmm. we traveled, I mean, all over. Went to Russia, yeah. which really was the key to that. We, we got you know, the red carpet mm -hmm. in Russia and were able to get pictures of stuff like uh, a Type 1 that Stalin yeah. himself had had at the Kremlin. Oh. That's on the cover. Cool. Um, all their newest stuff, mm -hmm. you know, and in the first one, 760 by 39 only, it was tough once again on the AK. How do you delineate? How do you separate them apart? Right. We decided volume one was 760 by 39 mm -hmm. only, AK and RPKs only. So no VZ 58s, yeah. nothing like that. And then now volume two coming up later this year is going to be AK 74. Nice. But when we went to you know, hit several different collections in the United States, hit a collection in Switzerland. I mean, we, we logged in tons of miles to get the yeah. stuff for that book. And I'm really, really happy with how it turned out. Yeah. Really happy. I've seen the videos where y'all were at Kalashnikov Concern, and how, they do they have a huge museum there? or Yeah, they do. They, they've got a big collection. They're in the process of organizing it. And then there's also kind of a factory museum, kind of an older one that has a lot of good stuff in it. Mm -hmm. It's a bit dated that's down in, in, in the same town as the factory. Yeah. So they're in the process of kind of, they've got a newer CEO, real squared away guy, real forward thinking guy. Mm -hmm. So he's bringing them up in a lot of ways to modern standards, in, not only in their manufacturing capability, but also how they're presenting their stuff. They're redoing their museum. And they're just kind of bringing things up to speed. Yeah, I've seen some of their videos on going back on the World War II firearms and the AKs and stuff. And I mean, they're dedicating a lot of time to that yeah. stuff. But well, they got so much history, yeah. you know, and it, it, the fall of the Soviet Union and whatnot, a lot of that stuff has kind of slipped through the cracks. And they're, I think they're just kind of trying to pick up the pieces and put it together in a presentable fashion. Yeah. But it's, I mean, they treated us, you know, fantastic. Yeah. We got access, and you see the pictures in the uh -huh. book, you know, we're, we're representative of how they treated us. Yeah. We're phenomenal. Now, in, in the second book, where y'all be covering the Nikonov age 94? It... That's a good question. <laughs> we're still figuring out, and we're, we're playing in three volumes. Uh, oh, okay. okay. We're playing in three volumes. Volume one, obviously, was 760 by 39. Volume two, 545, and I'm probably also gonna do 556 that's in the, in the AK-74. Mm -hmm. Not sure if we're gonna do the AN-94 or if that's gonna be volume three. Three. We're Ooh. still sorting that out because you know the the, the Kalashnikov and, and it and the guns it's influenced have just exploded yeah. and they kind of spider webbed everywhere. So you've got Sig 550s, FNCs, Seems. you got Valmets, you got Galils, that kind of stuff. Okay, that's a volume three topic. Yeah. Now where does something like the AN 94 come in? So and even the PKM. So yeah. we're still figuring that out. I don't know. We've got stuff on the AN 94 and it will for sure be in a future Vickers Guide book, whether it's volume two or volume three is to be determined. Cool. Now, whenever I said Nick enough, a lot of folks won't understand what that is. That's a, a, a whole completely, basically a different design. Absolutely. And it's the barrel reciprocates a little bit, doesn't it? And it'll... It's, yeah, real, yeah, real unique design. Yeah. And I'll be honest with you, I'm not even, I've seen animations, I've shot the gun, I'm not even 100% sure on how it works. Yeah. The, the guys who came up with that were really thinking out of the box. And essentially, in, it has a hyperburst mm -hmm. mode, a two-shot hyperburst mode that fires at 1,800 rounds a minute. And the barrel reciprocates and will fire the first shot, it starts moving to the rear, and it fires the second shot right before it hits full dead stop. So the shooter 
only really feels one recoil impulse. Wow. And it feels, having shot it, it's like an elongated recoil impulse. Mm -hmm. The theory behind that was they were going to be able to put two shots close to each other downrange. Um, so the average soldier could get one sight picture, pull the trigger, and get two shots on target. Now, I was able, a few years back in Russia, to shoot it on paper, which mm -hmm. I wanted to do. I was able to shoot it on paper at 20 meters, uh -huh. standing at a bullseye, uh, and, and, and the shots are about a little over an inch and a half apart at 20 meters. That's so cool. it would be on a man-sized target at 100 meters. Yeah. It would be on a, a man standing erect at 100 meters. You could get a sight picture, and you would have both projectiles on For a tough hit. Yeah. That Pretty new. Very complex. Yeah. Yeah. This got a cable running up yep. through there. And, Very yeah. complex. Um, heavy gun. Mm -hmm. Another thing, the balance is a little weird because the magazine, because of the mechanism, mm -hmm. the magazine doesn't go in straight from six o'clock. It goes in from a slight angle. Yeah. Um, so that kind of throws the balance off. It's a strange gun. As far as I know, they've only ever made a couple thousand okay. of them. Yeah. They didn't really. You know, when it came out, it was the typical propaganda that was going to be the new service oh, yeah. rifle, but that never, yeah. never happened. Yeah. Cool. I, and I kind of, it's so much more complex than an yeah. AK. I'm not really sure how they thought that yeah, was going to work Yeah, that's itself usually because the Russian firearms are basic, simple, easy to tear down, easy to strip, and that, then that just pops up. Boy, it's it like, is, what are you doing? Spectrum. Yeah. yeah, that was, it was bizarre. Wild stuff. Cool gun though. I'm glad yeah. I got to shoot it. Cool. And we got pictures of... The AN94. Oh. We also got pictures of pr prototype AN94s nice. for you know, for future books. So uh -huh. yeah, it was yeah, got good stuff. Wow. Okay, on the regular AK, seven six two or five four five. What's your favorite on that one? Man, I tell people everybody needs to have a seven sixty by thirty nine AK. Yep. If you were going to pick one caliber, that would be it. I really like shooting the mm -hmm. five four five a lot. I also feel the 545 is inherently more accurate. Uh -huh. um, I mean, they're both adequately accurate to get the job done. I do believe the 545 is an inherently more accurate caliber from my personal you know, experience. But I tell anybody, if you're just gonna pick one, it would be 760 by 39. And what's interesting now, kind of the Warsaw Pact is dissolved. 545 really is kind of, you know, Russia only. Yeah. It's, it's kind of faded away. So the AK-74 is really kind of, I mean, it's just kind of yeah, went into Russia only. centered right there. Outside of that, it's 760 by 39, 39. which is interesting that you would have ever guessed would almost be like the U.S. and its allies kind of going back to 762 NATO. Yeah. It's kind of interesting in a way. But now, by 45 really neat caliber. I like shooting. It's really soft shooting, mm -hmm. but I would say if you're going to have one, it would be 760 by 762 is pretty hard hitter. Yeah, it is. Okay, on the AKs, just regular AKs that you got in the book, which ones would probably, which one would you say be your favorite? Without a bunch? doubt, the the Stalin Type One on the type cover. One. Without a doubt, um, that gun was in mint condition. Mm. They were, they had two of them. They've got one on display at the Central Armed Forces Museum, that's on public display, mm. and then and this one was down in the archives. Had a real early sling on it yeah. with a unique attachment system that I had not seen since. The gun was. Absolutely superb conditions. Crazy. Apparently, the story goes mm -hmm. they were at the Kremlin. They'd been presented to Stalin. When, once he passed away, somewhere after that, they were given to the Central Armed Forces Museum, and they allowed us to take pictures of the one. Wow. That would definitely be my my favorite, favorite. without a doubt. Yeah. Now, we hear Type One, Type Two, whatever. The Type One, they, they have problems with the receivers. Yeah, it's a stamp sheet metal yeah. receiver. And they, you know, they had. Forged trunnion and whatnot that they they riveted to, they had real issues with it. And if you ever look at it, fairly crudely made, they had issues with basically keeping the receiver straight. Mm -hmm. You know, they had warpage yeah. issues. Now that being said, the ones that made it into service are perfectly functional, and you'll see pictures of them overseas, mm -hmm. in Iraq, yeah. Afghanistan, or whatnot. You'll see pictures of Type One they're actually being, but their reje reject rate during manufacture was so high that they went to a, an alternate. Mm -hmm. method to manufacture the receiver, yeah. which was a type two, two, as we know, it was a milled receiver. Yep. And then they simplified it as it, it became what we now know as the type three yeah. or the most common mm -hmm. of all milled receiver AKs. And it's basically a simplification of the type two receiver. Mm -hmm. Cool. It, it, type two is, a, uh -huh. we've got a couple of them in the book. Really cool gun. In a lot of ways, it's the coolest AK of them all. Mm -hmm. 
it's a blend of kind of type one features with some unique features of its own and then type, type three, three features. Yeah. And you saw that along the production line. To me, of, of all of them that were produced, those had those were beautiful guns. Oh, I mean, yeah. the finish on the receivers, they were they, they put a little time in there. They them. were very well made guns. Yes. I mean, the, the concept of them being crude and all that is completely no, mistaken. That's, that's, they were exceptionally well made guns. The Type 2s are really, really cool. Guns. Yeah. Early AKs in general are really cool guns. Yes, yeah, they are. The crudest one I've ever seen was a North Korean made AK. Those things look like. It's the crudest one I've ever seen. We actually have it in the book is Albanian. Oh yeah, it's even cruder than North Korean. I'll be there now. Yeah, it's even, and they're they're very much Chinese pattern uh -huh. AKs. Yeah, made with Chinese assistance and in many cases yep. Chinese parts. Um, but that would be the crudest, even cruder than the North Korean. Mm -hmm. Cool. East German AKs. Oh man, dynamite! <laughs> they're dynamite guns. They're... Of, the, of the stamp sheet metal mm -hmm. AKs and AK AK74 variants, they're awesome guns. Yeah, the MPI. Yeah. K, yeah. Yep. They're great guns. Um, nice. The side folding stock they have is, mm -hmm. leaves a little bit to be desired from an end user point yeah, of view. Yeah, that little wire. Yeah. yeah, which of course Romania used, and whereas Poland did on the Tantal mm -hmm. and whatnot. But they have, boy, they're well-made guns. Yeah, very well-made guns. Cool guns. Okay, now then, 1911 work. You also, you're a custom gun maker. I well, mean, I really don't build guns anymore. But yeah. what I do do is teach a 1911 gunsmith class. You know, about once a year, maybe once every couple mm -hmm. years. It takes a little while to get the clientele together, yeah. and then um, it's not a cheap class. Plus, the guys got to take a week off work. Um, but yeah, we they come in with a box full of parts, and then we, in the, in the course of five and a half days, we take it from a box full of parts to a functioning pistol by the end of the week. Yeah, and it's drinking from a fire hose. I'll yeah. tell you that. A lot of guys don't realize that you just can't drop no, parts no. in on a 1911. They're, they're not a Glock, they're not anything else. No, There's not. a lot of hand fitting, uh, special work, special tools on those. Yeah, and you have to assume that every everything's got to be hand fitted. Yeah. There might be something you can just put on and drops in, like grips or whatnot, yeah. but you don't assume that's going to be the case. You actually should assume the opposite. Yeah. Now, I'm going to put these grips on and they're going to interfere with the safety. Or I'm going to put these, you know, whatever on the gun, and mm -hmm. it's going to interfere with this, and it's going to need to be hand fitted. That's the nature of the beast with the 1911. Yeah, yeah. You, I've seen a lot of guys. They'll buy a barrel, stick it in. It's like, well, this this doesn't fit. It's like, you just got to be fitted. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> fit. Yeah, I remember a buddy of mine I worked with in the army. He's, what do you mean? You just take it and drop it in, and, and it fits. It's like, no, nah, dude, that's not how it works. Yeah. Nah. And guys that'll have am, or put an ambi safety, ambi thumb safeties on, and they'll slip the grips on. It's like, well, the safety's not yep. working. It's like, well, there's a little cut on that grip you got to make. Bingo. <laughs> oh, man. Now, you're also doing training. I mm -hmm. mean, uh, Aztec training. Yeah. I've been doing training classes for a number of years, mainly law enforcement, military, and civilian, mm -hmm. uh, pistol and carbine. A lot of pistol classes. Yeah. And we live in a CCW world now. Yep. Um, the classes are hosted by Aztec Training mm -hmm. Services, and I have a list of my classes on my website, Vickers, VickersTactical.com. But um, travel all over the country, just did a class in California, yeah. got a class coming up down in Louisiana. I mean, I'm all over the country doing a lot of pistol classes. CCW now, I mean, we, everybody, and everybody needs a handgun skill set. Mm -hmm. I don't care who you are. Yeah. I mean, you could be law enforcement, military, civilian, it doesn't matter. Everybody needs a handgun skill set yeah. because handguns are the most common firearms in use daily in terms of for defensive purposes. Mm -hmm. Everybody needs to know how to use them. Yeah. A lot of folks, they just think, well, I'll buy a gun, stick it in yeah. my pocket. But it, it doesn't work yeah, like I that. I bought it now, and it means I know how to use it. And it's like, no, it's no. not the case at all. It's no different than buying a guitar or whatever. Yeah. You know, and, I have a good buddy of mine, my buddy Dave Royer has made a great line. He said, you wouldn't buy scuba equipment or a parachute and not get training for it because you know it's a piece of life-saving equipment. Why would you buy a gun, which is also a piece of life-saving equipment, and not get proper training on it? Right. Which is right. a really good point. It's all about training. Now, also, folks, if you haven't checked out the Vickers Tactical videos on YouTube, mm -hmm. Please do, because those are some of the most crazy slow motion that I have ever seen. I mean, y'all are covering everything. Yeah, and one of the hallmarks of our channel is the slow motion camera. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it was not a cheap camera by any stretch. Yeah. Um, but that's one of the reasons people come to our channel, so we're gonna make sure we, we give them what they need. And we always try to get the feedback from the viewers, mm -hmm. read the comments, what they like, what they don't like, and then tweak it 
yeah. a little bit. Some guys like more slow mo. Some guys like less. It's it's we try to hit the sweet spot. Yeah, you know what I mean. Um, yeah, we're we're oil happy. I tell you what else is interesting when you're filming those slow mo shots. It gives you the inside look of how the gun works. Yeah, and you you see stuff that you would never see with your naked eye because you know it's slow motion. Yeah, and you can really like case in point. Everybody comments on this is how much barrel wobble they see. Yeah, and the barrels move around quite a bit. That's why something like a free float handguard has been developed over the years mm -hmm. for the AR-15 M16 family. There's a reason for that. Yeah, I, we did a video on. A, I've got an SVT-40, and we did a slow mo on that. And the barrel whip on that, oh, wow. I mean, it's just, you never would have thought that out of that. But. No, exactly. And you, you'll see him, you're shooting. You're like, whoa. <laughs> and I, we did one a while back on an AK, mm -hmm. stamp sheet metal yep. AK, and boy, that thing. It flexes, oh, it moves around. The receiver around. flexes, yeah. Yeah, that's, that's one thing about the AK is, is a, guys that are building them and putting them together, they don't understand that there's the flex in that gun. It's, yes, it's the way it's made. And so there's no free lunch with that gun. If I want a, a gun to carry a lot, mm -hmm. then an AKM, a stamp sheet metal AKM. If I want a gun to shoot, machine receiver gun. Yeah. Now, if you have to carry it a lot, then you know that's a heavy gun. So it's kind of like, do you want one that you're going to shoot that's more comfortable to shoot, mm -hmm. you know, more controllable, or you want one you got to carry? Yeah. That, you know what I mean? That's more comfortable to carry because when you there's a dramatic difference between the two in terms of weight and shootability versus ease to carry. Yeah, I kind of, I kind of slipped over into the CZ world, VZ58. Oh, yeah. VZ58. Yeah, those, those are cool guns. I like it. They shoot good. Yeah, we did a um, video on one, a select fire mm -hmm. one. Much higher psychic rate of fire than people think. Yeah, they they'll get it down the line yeah, real buddy. quick. Yeah, <laughs> big time. Now, <laughs> semi-auto carrying around, real soft mm -hmm. shooting gun, yeah. cool gun. Yeah, the Chicks, Chicks make some wonderful, wonderful guns. And that, to me, that was probably, the, whenever they took that over the AK, that was a pretty cool move. What's interesting is it has that in, linear hammer, mm -hmm. and it generally had the great, great triggers. Yeah. So you're not having to release a hammer, you're releasing a linear hammer, so it's almost like a striker-fired gun yeah. in a way. And they generally have a really good trigger because of it. Yep, they're cool. Now, on the World War II side, kind of divvy over that way, you did the World War II Vickers Guide right mm -hmm. there, and some of the guns in there, well, all of them, I mean, are just amazing. Well, big World War II guy, and if you're a small arms guy, a military small arms guy, almost everybody is an enthusiast of World War II German mm -hmm. small arms based on the impact they had in, in military small arms, yeah. and they still do to this day. I mean, those guns, you can see all around this SHOT Show, influences from folding sites, I mean, on down the line, yeah. that were basically, they, that stemmed from World War II German small arms. So the theory behind that was, that there was we we're gonna have to do two volumes, there was no way to cover it in one. Yeah. And then the first one, which we released last Christmas, mm -hmm. and the next one's gonna be out this summer, nice. summer 2019, is was pistols, of course, submachine mm -hmm. guns, and whatnot now, you know, in bolt action rifles. Yeah. Now, now we're picking up some auto rifles, assault rifles. You know, other guns like the FG42. Yeah. yeah MG34, MG42. That now is going to be in volume two. Nice. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. That Sturmgewehr 44s. Yep. Yep. All that. Matter of fact, we have a Sturmgewehr on the cover. Yeah. Which, cool. I mean, I kind of was befitting to be on the cover. <laughs> yeah. The MP38 was on the cover oh, of the first yeah. one. MP38 for cool guns. Oh, really cool guns. They were, were awesome. Yeah. I, every time, I mean, if there wasn't a German World War II movie made that didn't have an MP40, MP34 in it. I mean, M MP38. Yeah, in it. The MP38 is a neat gun. Yeah. I mean, MP40 is much more common. And MP38, of course, is, you know, the machine receiver yeah. version. They're yeah. cool guns. They're yeah, really they, cool they guns. were heavy guns. Yeah, they too. were heavy. Yeah, they were heavy. I mean, even the MP40 is a fairly heavy gun, yeah. all stamp sheet metal, but the 38 is. Yeah, the, the easiest way to tell the difference between the 38 and the 40, the 38 will have the flutes on mm -hmm. the receiver. receiver yeah, yeah, the fine flutes all the way down yeah. the length of the receiver. Yeah, absolutely. Cut, cut, trying to cut weight out of those. Yep. Now, submachine gun wise, World War II, which one? Which is the coolest? The one I probably like shooting the most is probably the MP40. The one that is probably the best of all the World War II submachine mm -hmm. guns is probably the PPS 43. That's a 
that's a bullet hose right there. Yeah, it is a really good gun. Yeah. It is a really good gun. It's interesting, Kalashnikov himself felt like the PPS-43 was the best submachine gun in World War II. Mm -hmm. And actually, if you shoot and use them a lot, um, he, he has a good point. There's a, that, that is a good gun. Yeah. A really good gun. Folding stock. Yeah, I mean, folds it's compact. The top, double feed mag, so it's yep. easy to load. Yeah. Real yeah. easy to load. Very, you know, M1 Garand style mm -hmm. safety mechanism. Yep. Very controllable, so it's easy to get off single shots. Um, you know, slow cycle yeah. rate of fire, all things compared. I mean, it's a good gun. I mean, if you ever get a chance to shoot it at PPS 43, that's a good gun. A lot of guns kind of get the glamour of it. PPS H41, mm -hmm. the MP40, the Thompson, the Grease Gunner, yeah. a lot of different guns have certainly have kind of captured the imagination of the of the shooting public over the PPS 43, yeah. but in a lot of ways it, it is, in many ways, the best submachine gun award. Yeah. Those stayed in production in various countries for years. Yeah, for years. quite a while. Poland, I've seen a lot of Polish Yeah, guns Chinese ones. Yeah, one, yeah. yeah, absolutely. You're right, Polish made ones, which are very well made yeah. guns. I think yeah. those were Circle 11. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, yeah Circle 11 guns. Yeah. We're very well made. Yeah, Pol some of the Polish guns are awesome. Oh, yeah. Good guns. And it's interesting how certain countries like Poland and Hungary mm -hmm. and then the Czech, Czechoslovakia or the Czech Republic yeah. have this lineage of making excellent small arms. And they're overshadowed by you know, Russian or German or yeah. whatnot, but they made small arms for within their within their military industrial complex or their the use for their military, and the guns were very well made, yeah. exceptionally well made. Now, have you ever shot a, a Beretta 38? Oh yeah, 38A? we just did a video on yeah. one. Okay, cool. Yeah, Beretta 38A. We yes. just did a video on one not long ago. I've got one, and they the they just they're shoot. Cool. Just they're big, but they yep. they shoot really good. Dual triggers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Semi-automatic, full automatic. Yeah, you know, and everybody you ever anything you ever read, the, the troops loved them. Yeah, they were real real happy with it. Yeah. They are big guns, mm -hmm. fairly heavy, with their soft shooting. Yeah. They're pussycats to shoot. They're awesome. Then, then they went down to the 3842. Yeah, simplified. Yep, fluted barrels and 3844s, and then that's pretty much it. To me, that was one of the coolest guns that Beretta ever made. And what else is interesting is the, all those magazines are reverse compatible in mm -hmm. terms of the Beretta M12. Yeah. That magazine is reverse compatible with all those others. Yeah. So regardless, you have a 38 or a Beretta M12 or a 3842 or whatever, the mags interchange yeah. all. Now the Beretta, the M12, that's the little sub yeah. Machine gun, yeah. yeah we just did a video on it too. That nice. you ever shot one? No, Dude, that is shooting. a really cool gun. Yeah, Telescoping have, bolt, uh -huh. like a, a you know Czech VZ yep. series submachine gun or an Uzi. Uzi, yep. Um, boy, they're well-made guns. It, it's and they shoot great. Nice. That is a really cool gun. I have to go find Red one. Red M12 was a <laughs> yeah, cool stuff. Okay, World War II handguns. I'm I'm sorry I'm picking your brain, but no I, I love. Love the AKs, World War II. I mean, I'm a collector of World War II firearms and stuff. But my favorite World War II handgun mm -hmm. is the P38, and, and the reason being yeah. is it was such. It, it set the standard for the double action, single action service mm -hmm. pistol as we know it today. Essentially, an M9 Beretta um, is nothing more than a P38 with a Browning high power magazine. Yeah, I mean that's really what it is. Um, so really, the double action, single action service pistol started with. The P38, and it's going to mm -hmm. essentially end with the P38. Now we live in a world now with the M17, yeah. of course, you know, uh, Sig polymer striker fired gun, the Glock, and whatnot. So we, we're in the, the beginning of the sun setting so, on the double action, single yeah. action Europe. But it's interesting how it started with the P38 and basically ended with the P38 with the M9 Beretta. Beretta. Yeah. yeah. So that that because of that, I'm a big fan of the P38. Yeah. It's my favorite of all World War II small arms. They shoot good. The handguns, yeah. I should say. The lockup in them is yeah, really neat. Yeah, they're real soft shooting yeah. because of that. Yeah, I'm, I've shot a Luger a lot, and the way that that barrel reciprocates back and forth, and that toggle lock up on it, it's a different feel. It and is. then whenever you start going to the P38, it's like, pow. Oh, yeah. Sights are better. Yeah. Yeah. The real issue there is a double action trigger pull. I mean, that takes some skill to yeah. overcome that and be able to use it effectively. But in terms of the gun and its reliability, historical significance, I mean, mm -hmm. they're a cool gun. I think everybody needs to own a P38. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I'm, you... I'm big. That's my favorite World War II <laughs> handgun. Cool. Anything else? Handgun wise? Nope. Well, you know, we live in a Glock world. I don't know if you guys have gotten that memo or not. <laughs> Um, I do my training classes, half of any class, at least half is Glocks. Yeah. And that's all over the world. Yeah. Not just in the United States, I could go to Europe, Switzerland, wherever, and the Glock nominates. It's amazing to me, food for thought here, we've got a just a couple more minutes. Yeah. 
food for thought. The Glock is really the 1911 of this day and age. Right. If you look at the 1911 and when it came out and its contemporaries and the impact it had, and then you look at the Glock and its contemporaries and the impact it had, very similar. Also, almost the same number of parts. When you look at the 1911, you break down every single part mm -hmm. and the Glock. Now yeah. You got to look at every part, even the little, you know, even the little um, rails that are molded yeah. into the frame. Yep. Those are a separate part. Granted, you can't disassemble them, but you know, but those were components that were injection molded into mm -hmm. the frame at the factory. The, almost the same number of parts between the two. Okay. And when you look at the impact that that gun is the 1911 had oh, yeah. and the Glock has had, it's amazing how those two guns really. Those two guns absolutely have dominated the handgun scene. They've since changed they were the world. Introduced. Yeah, they both absolutely changed the world, both of them. That's crazy. All right, folks. Well, I hope you enjoyed it. And thank you so much to Mr. Larry hey, Vickers for stopping by. Thank you. We appreciate it every time. All right. Be sure and check back whenever we have our next Facebook Live. And I can't remember who it is, but I know it's Steve Ostrom is going to be doing it.